Um, this is uh, Walk, Listen, Cafe, and it's with uh, Sarah Parry, and the title is Gender in the City. Um, what is a fe feminist city anyway? Um, and uh, I listened to uh, an event, uh, I think it was back in July or August, which was run by uh, an activist organization in London called um, Living Streets. They, they, for many years, they were called uh, the Pedestrians Association, and and during that um, uh, uh, event, um, Sarah Parry uh, popped up and she um, talked about um, this uh, topic, which has always interested me for a long time, the gendered city, and I thought, wow, uh, uh, this woman's coming at it at a really interesting angle. Uh, and I want to invite her to come and talk at a cafe because um, for the most part, our, uh, uh, the walking artists that we have within our community, the, most, the majority of you are women, one. Uh, two, the majority of you are urban-based uh, artists. Uh, and um, uh, thirdly, um, all of you, and uh, quite rightly, uh, have uh, included uh, the sort of injustices of the gendered city in much of your work. So um, I knew you'd be a, a really uh, good audience to encourage Sarah to continue with the work that she's doing, but also explore the, uh, the topic as widely and as much in depth as possible. So I'm going to introduce you to Sarah by what she wrote on her um, a biography on the Walk, Listen, Create site, uh, but she might tell you a little bit more about herself. So she's um, a, a mature student, a master's student studying town and regional planning at Leeds Beckett University. She's interested in the built environment and how we can create sustainable urban spaces that promote equality. Um, in her studies, she's taken a particular interest in how we can create spaces that are gender equal and encourage women and men to use and engage the city equally. She's interested in hearing the views, opinions, and experiences of everyone who interact with urban spaces to help better inform how these spaces can respond to these needs. Um, uh, the other thing that we should mention is that uh, Sarah is, um, she works for a local authority. She works in their regeneration team. Uh, she knows uh, an awful lot about the uh, practicalities of getting things changed um, within and beyond a local authority. And uh, for those who are not familiar with Leeds, uh, Leeds is um, one of the top five largest uh, urban conurbations uh, in the UK. So it's a, it's a big modern city and it has the largest student population of any city in, in the UK. So Sarah, um, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Leeds, I think it mu must have the biggest uh, student city because I think we have three, if not four universities here. Um, so we have quite quite a reach, uh, that's for sure. Um, but yes, I'm almost finished uh, doing my masters. So it's in town and regional planning. So I'm coming at this from a planning angle which is very sort of structured and, and process driven and um sort of has a lot of um a systemic history um so my interest from my academic studies has really been in how women use the city and sort of taking a feminist angle on it as well um so a lot of um my readings have, have come from that and applying my own experience as well so I was going to kick off today with a presentation which I hope isn't too long I will try and um, rattle through it which throws up some of these findings um, with a couple of sort of real life examples at the end um, but please along the way feel free to challenge anything that I throw up um, I think that there's obviously um, as women or men none of our views are going to be completely homogenous i think we all approach life slightly differently um so while this these are findings they may not apply to you so it's one for discussion so really do challenge challenge where you want or agree or yeah just to discuss and i think that any findings from today um will be great just to deepen further um 
the findings that I've had already on how women use the city. So I'll share my screen now and it actually makes everyone disappear. So I won't be able to see you, but I can still hear you. Um, so feel free to, to shout out or, or challenge it at any point. Um, I really, I welcome it, if anything. Um, so if someone can just shout if, if you can see my screen. Yeah, that's good, Sarah, yeah. Amazing, thank you. So um, first off, I'll just c cover sort of what we mean by, by gender. Um, so while sex is the biological categories of male and female, gender is defined by the World Health Organization, refers to the characteristics of women, men, boys and girls that are socially constructed and it can refer to social, behavioural and cultural attributes and norms associated with male or female. And as I mentioned before, these aren't homogenous necessarily. Um, everyone may experience genders differently. Um, they may or may not correspond to the sex people are assigned with at birth. Um, but it's also not the only way in which we, we uh, perceive cities. So while I'm going to focus on this, there's things like age, sex, social class, ethnicity that, that will all affect how, how we see and perceive a city. Um, so a, a feminist critique of, of planning in cities is that women don't have equal access to the city. Um, and they note that sort of planners and planning has created an urban form that predominantly suits the needs of men and this can perpetuate gender inequalities and undermine how women are able to access facilities and opportunities that are present um, within a city and in effect how they're able to thrive in that public sphere um, but equality is is enshrined uh, in human rights um, as you can see on on the screen um, but some of the news articles on the right which awfully are, are all fairly recent um, show that, that women don't necessarily have that equality of access. Um, so just to pull out some concepts of, of feminist utopia and and these span quite a broad broad time frame but really stuck out to me during my research. So there's there's no one sort of feminist utopian idea and they draw on quite a spectrum of material including science fiction, history, politics, um, but quite often they sort of challenge those taken for granted power relations. So the city of ladies, which is sort of the, the oldest one that I've looked at so far is from 1405 and describes the creation of a city of ladies uh, where women have created a safe haven away from, from men based on their personal merits and, and not their birth status as, as well as a lot more applicable at the time. And this enabled them to move away from those typical gender roles and learn skills and have this to be recognised and, and valued. Um, Sultana's Dream created a feminist utopia named Ladyland, where men were confined to segregated quarters and, and performed daily mundane tasks, whereas women uh, sort of headed, headed up everything supported by a queen and deputies and used their intellect to run the countries. Um, and this showed how women became proficient in science and technology and used it for their benefit. The shore of, of women, similarly to, to Sultana's dream, um, revolved around whereby men had created a, a nuclear catastrophe, as you can see in the background, um, and made them to be considered unworthy of power and removed from the city. And it said women were all becoming scientists and researchers and, and politicians within these protected walls. Um, so you can see that it's quite a, a diverse range really of, of these different ones, but they're reacting against these limitations placed on women um, and share that common desire to create space for women to, to work and, and live and feel safe. Um, but it does, it segregates the, the two genders, which is across each of these. Um, a feminist critique of planning notes that this is sort of emerge because there's unequal power relations in the profession and planning has long been dominated by men and because of this the able-bodied working male has been considered the neutral user of the city and so they're designed by and for this neutral user. Um, some contemporary urban implications that 
I've pulled out and find quite interesting are around zoning transport and safety. Um, so zoning was sort of this um, mono land use thought um, where public and, and private spheres were developed and different land uses were separated. So as you can sort of see from the image on the left, you've got the more sort of factories and, and office space towards the back segregated from um, retail use from residential areas. Um, but this actually sort of compounded those those gender rules, whereas men would typically go to work in, in the factories or, or the office space and women would stay at home. These spaces are so separate that it's quite difficult to, to integrate them together. So women are becoming more and more involved in, in the workforce, but they still provide about 75 percent of the world's unpaid care. Um, but a feminist critique would argue that that residential areas being so separate from the world of work, being so separate from where a school or a care home may be, make accessing each of these spaces difficult. Um, and it, this difficulty often falls on women who, who are responsible for those other uh, unpaid jobs outside of work. And similarly, this has impacted transport. Um, so quite often transport will cater for commuters so people from to travel from residential areas to the office core to the factories and it doesn't cater for those more sporadic random trips that may often fall on women who have that care role to travel from retail to office core um, and instead don't only take them from from retail uh, from residential to the to the office space and as well, price is factored into this. Sometimes it, it may be the case where you live. It certainly is for me that you can get very simple bus tickets that take you into and out of town. But to get a ticket that will take you around all of the different zones, as it were, that, that you need is often more expensive or even not available. And safety is also pulled out quite often as as an implication of, of this mono land use and urban planning. And it can often be not necessarily stemming from a personal experience um, of fear and feeling unsafe in a space, but it's the perception, it's the knowledge that um, people have, you know, faced unsafety, have um, faced harassment or attacks. And it's this perception that, that can really affect how people and, and women feel they are able to interact with a space. Um, so land use may have affected this. Often between zones, there are areas of no man's land, which often have less people, less eyes on the street, um, and can really feel unsafe and remote. And a feminist critique of planning would argue that this has happened because of a lack of representation from women in the planning profession. Um, so some modern feminist ideas. Um, Jacobs and Kerner are two of the most sort of heralded um, feminist writers and Jacobs uh, rejected zoning, the practice of zoning and instead advocated for a real mix of uses within a space and she argued that this mix creates vibrant and usable spaces, more eyes on the streets, uh, increasing that feeling of safety social cohesion, feeling as though people are able to, to really use and engage with the space. Um, Leslie Kern wrote The Feminist City and she looked at cities through motherhood and for care. Um, so she often raises the point of public transport not catering for, for care uh, and designing a city that accommodated this better will not only help women to, to fulfil this role, but will enable that role of care to be shared a lot better um, and it, it's simple things such as public transport but designing spaces that are usable with a push chair or usable with when you have lots of bags or, an, or um, an elderly person who are helping to travel around and it's from this that both Jacobs and Kern argued that you can actually make spaces by making them more accommodating for women actually helps with so many other people in society such as disabled people, children, the elderly um, to access because it makes places so much more accessible. 
And the two documents on the right, the, the new urban agenda in, in Her City, they both set out standards and principles for planning and implementing more gender equal places. Um, Her City creates a toolbox which um, people are able to to use and can advocate for things such as greater participation from, from women and more meaningful participation, and really identifying those things that will perhaps hold women back um, from accessing a space in the same way that a man would. Um, so some of the sort of international examples that I've looked at, um, this looks like a terrible quality picture actually now that it's on a big screen, so apologies for that. Um, but Vienna is quite often heralded as an exemplar of a gender equal city, and they've had a number of, of pilot projects um, since the sort of 1990s, which include things like widening pavements, um, putting additional seating in places, improving street safety. And one of their projects um, was the Frauen Werkstatt, which created an apartment complex built by women for women and families. And it really integrated flexible apartment layouts, uh, rooftop communal laundries, open kitchen layouts, on-site kindergartens, and really advocated for people to be able to share the role of care and the work of care, um, increase that feeling of safety, eyes on the street, um, and improve women being able to feel they can access these, these spaces. Um, Another example from Vienna is Einsiedler Park, and they found that this park was largely dominated um, by boys who would play games like football, um, ball sports, and in that girls didn't necessarily, after the age of seven at least, um, use the park that much and, and get involved in those activities. So they worked with um, the girls to see what, what they wanted from this space. And it was things such as visible footpaths, good lighting, wide entrances and exits, but also things like areas for, for rest, to linger, to dwell, for that space to be divided into sub zones so that no sort of one sport, football, for example, can, can dominate the space and to have more games such as netball and volleyball, climbing, balancing. Um, as you can see in the top left picture, they've put in like a, a little platform and that has a number of roles. Um, it, you can sit on it, but um, they found that, P, that girls would often do uh, like dancing shows on it or gymnastics, um, climb on it, things like that. And from the picture on the right, you can see there's more, there's seating, um, there's smaller activities that wouldn't dominate the space and wide entrances and exits as well to really increase um, the, the openness and the visibility. Um, Yumia as well has on the on the left, as you can see, that statue is called Listen, but it's the first Me Too statue, um, which really celebrates um, or recognises uh, the harassment that, that women face and, and stands up for that. Um, Project Frieson, which you can see, which is another poor quality picture, I apologise. Um, they worked with women and girls to find what they wanted from a park. And they wanted spaces that were well lit, that were open, that offered seating, opportunities to dwell, um, but that felt safe and felt usable. So they created this sort of spherical um, structure, which has a number of seats on it, which is well lit within the park, um, which has proven really positive. Um, and in Yumia, they created the Lev Passage, which was actually in response to a series of sexual assaults um, a few years ago now. And this passage links uh, the city centre with, with one of the popular outskirt neighbourhoods and passes by the station. So it's a really well used route. Um, but a number of assaults happened in this area. So they created this passage, which is is well lit, is wide, has open staircases, as you can see in the picture um, in the top left. And it's actually filled with, with poetry, um, which I think comes through speakers as well. Maybe wrong on that one. Um, but it connects these routes and is 
is able to be used by by women but also increase that feeling of safety for disabled users for older users um they have more uh, sloped areas so it's not necessarily just stairs um and can enable anyone anyone to use the space and malmo is, they created a series of pocket parks um, throughout the throughout the city and worked with women and girls to find out what they wanted from the space and similar to to in vienna they found that they wanted spaces with lots of different uses that where no one use dominated that provided spaces not just for football but areas for dancing for climbing um that were well lit and could be used by by anyone but not dominated by anyone and um, so they created this and in the group they worked with has actually stayed together through after the the period and now advocates for more gender equal spaces across malmo um so I've pulled a couple of slides together which, which show spaces, some of which are in Leeds, some of which are, are international examples. Um, and I just thought it was a little bit thought provoking and, and if anyone has any thoughts, then please do shout out about any of these images. Um, but talk about how usable these, these spaces are. So this is the main high street in Leeds. Um, and I actually spoke with colleagues about this um, and if they found it usable and a couple of mothers in the group found the space really usable because a lot of the entrances into the shops um, are not they're flat so they're not step access so if you have a push chair you're able to get in easily um, if you have an elderly person in a wheelchair you can access the space easily it's all on one level um, it's well lit there's sort of seating throughout it um, and lots of ground floor usages as well which being a city centre obviously um, may not be quite as achievable in, in outside areas, but they found this a really good space for women. Um, I'll roll on to this slide, which is an underpass in Leeds, um, which is maybe a bit of a provocative image, but is not as well lit, um, not as visible. It has a slope, but it's quite a steep slope. Um, it's definitely not welcoming, but to get to it, goes under quite a big road and to get over that road um, is a very unpleasant urban environment, lots of fast moving traffic, um, cars and step access, which, which makes it quite difficult to um, get across the space as well. Um, this is taken from Vienna, which is another poor quality image, um, which has a, a huge obviously difference in, in land height and while they previously had stairs, they then put a lift in, which is great for people who, who aren't able to take stairs as easily. They can go in if they have a wheelchair or, or a pushchair, um, or even if, if they just find walking difficult. So I think that sort of shows how making the space more usable for women actually works to make it more usable for, for everyone. Um, this is another space in Leeds, which on the surface from, from conversations I had, we found to be a really usable space for, for women. Um, but someone challenged me and actually mentioned that this is in quite the, the office core of Leeds. And while it may be great in the day, in the evening, when there aren't as many people around, there's not sort of the workers, it can actually feel quite um, isolated and, and lonely. So I think there's something there around looking at spaces at, at all times of day. Um, this is this is a bridge which in Leeds uh, we've tried to animate through through artwork, which that generated a bit of a of a contrasting response. I think it's definitely an improvement from the left to the right. Um, but is there still more we can do to make this feel welcoming and, and usable? Um, this is another bridge in, in Leeds as well, which is, it goes over a railway, um, but the walls are six foot something. Um, it can be quite dark at night time um, and definitely perhaps not feel usable. Um, and I think this is my final picture. 
Uh, this, I believe, as well, is in Vienna, um, offers spaces for dwells, such as the benches, lighting. Um, it's overlooked by lots of residential spaces um, and is often held as a bit of an exemplar on how we can build walkable streets as well that aren't dominated by cars that enable people with pushchairs um, to use them, but would then accommodate for people who, who don't uh, need that, that additional access, um, but to help them use the space and access the space equally. So there's quite a lot of images there from, from different parts of the city. Um, obviously the town centre is gonna be different from, from residential spaces, but thought provoking as to what spaces inspire different feelings in us. Um, so that's the end of, of my presentation and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Um, but it would be great to hear people's thoughts if, if you agreed or if you disagreed, please feel free to, to challenge. I think it's all about perception um, and we're all gonna think differently about it, but hopefully it's maybe made you think how you feel about the city and in spaces and what are inviting spaces and what aren't perhaps. Um, so thanks for listening and sorry if I, I rambled on a bit there. Um, I think there's plenty to go at and this is just one, one aspect um, of what I've looked at. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so don't be bashful. Uh, anyone want to speak up and say an immediate reaction to what they heard? Was it something all too familiar? Or did you see some things you uh, were unaware of? I think we have some very good design features in some of the estates. You know, you mentioned regeneration and all of the you know a lot of the design uh, in some of the London estates which were about keeping eyes on children so that you'd have backland that all the kitchen windows looked out onto um, with a big open space where all the children could play in an enclosed area those are being designed out with the regeneration and all the tower blocks that are being built at the moment so that that's something that's really quite sad and uh, this preponderance to gating everywhere is being gated so that if you did have a problem and you're walking along the pavement there's nowhere to go because everyone's got electronic gates and the estate near me actually is being built on a series of courtyards and every single courtyard will be gated um, and it works in reverse too so those people who live on the gated estate don't have any involvement with the community. So, you know, there's, there's no community feeling, it becomes anonymised. I, I also, I was listening to your presentation, I had in mind John Prescott years ago, um, said that everyone should be able to jump out of bed and, and go to work, you know, walk to work. And I've lived here 30 years, and when I first moved here, it was possible to do that. There were so many small businesses, workshops, there was a laundry across the road, and 60 people used to fall out of bed, literally, and just walk to work to the laundry from the estate. And now everything is housing. There's no work uh, spaces. So all those people walking to work created a feeling of, of community, of eyes on the street, like, you know, references to Jane Jacobs. There's lots of small businesses, even little parlours, not sh proper shops, but they would do repairs for you. So, you know, everyone had a reason for walking around. Anyway, I, I won't say too much more than that, but it, it's just about, we really have gone backwards in terms of those things that we used to value in our community and no longer exist and are being designed out now. Yeah, definitely. Andrew and I were actually talking just before this started about um, another area of research I've been looking at is the 20 minute neighbourhood, um, which I don't know if, if any of you have heard of, perhaps you are familiar with, which talks about how um, 
services and facilities that, that you require on a daily basis should be accessible within a 10 minute walk of where you live, which equals about 800 meters. So things like employment, retail, green spaces, um, hospital, well, uh, pharmacies, medical things um, should be located within that time frame. If not, for there to be public transport available within, within that radius. Um, and that has been raised in, in feminist literature about how that can design a more equal and accessible city. So, yeah, as you said, it's it's making sure that those opportunities for employment, opportunities for, for retail, you can roll out of bed and, and you can reach them within within a walk. And I think perhaps that the 20 minute neighborhood is, is getting a lot of support. So it's perhaps how we can promote that and promote that with that feminist lens to when we do regenerate, think about spaces in that 20 minute neighborhood um, remit. So that's something I'm really interested in as well and, and perhaps something that I can hopefully push within my professional work as well. Is there anyone who was uh, on last week's cafe as well and um, might like to think about the, the differences that Sarah mentioned? Uh, Sarah didn't actually attend the cafe, but she has been able to watch the video, so uh, she's up to speed with that. But for those who, who didn't go uh, or didn't see it, uh, it was a film made five years ago in, in Brazil, uh, um, urban area in Brazil, um, where in which the filmmakers followed uh, women uh, in different spaces and different routes that they took through the city um, and um, had um, a commentary by by women, not necessarily the women that were being followed, but uh, by women about the um, uh, assaults and abuse that they'd uh, received at certain times and uh, how they'd reacted to it. But what was also clear was that when you watch the film, um, many of the spaces were, were very isolated and very uh, car dominated. And uh, I think that's a interesting point that Sarah took one or two examples of places where um, routes that were or had been uh, perceived as unsafe by women and how the changes had been made um, in accordance to what women themselves were were saying would make good changes. So what we, we, uh, I think what would be really nice is if someone could perhaps talk about whether there are things that you've seen or observed in where you live or where you walk um, where changes have been made and what those changes might be that have improved the area has anyone got any examples that they could share what well, walton forest I that, that, sorry 100 things to say on this um i'm often uh replying to planning comments um, and objections in our in our local area, for example, um, it, they're trying to make a low traffic neighbourhood um, and build that better from lockdown. Um, so bollards went in to uh, reduce the amount of parking spaces. Uh, it made the pavements wider. It was really pleasant as a cyclist. I could use them to stay safe from the main um, traffic lanes. Um, and, uh, th these are put in as a test, but then as soon as uh, someone shouted out very loudly and to the media, um, they got them taken out, or the majority of them taken out, because he couldn't park his van in front of his furniture shop on a public highway. So um, a single, uh, well, it probably wasn't the only one, but a business owner shouted loudly for parking. And so everyone else is benefiting from the wider pavements. And this is during a time of social distancing. Um, everyone else had to sort of uh, compromise in favor of the traffic. So that's like one example in our area, but at a, at a wider level, um, I was just gonna ask Sarah, is there anything in um, our current planning process that allows for um, a feminist city or some kind of check in that area because uh, there are traffic officers 
and there are environmental officers and wildlife officers, is there anything that actually forces the planning process to run it by people outside of, you know, the, the apart from public comments, is there anything that covers the kind of gendered um, issues that you're talking about? I think it can vary um, from local authorities. I think in terms of sort of a national uh, level, there's reference to making sure that places are accessible for, for all. It's, it's quite high level, I think, in, in what it says. Um, for each local authority, they can have sort of more um, specific reference, perhaps to what, what that means. And I think it's for local authorities to, to really push that forward and and um, create those sort of planning systems and, and policies that can really reflect it. So I think it's areas that can definitely be be improved and perhaps uh, leveled across across the playing field in, in England anyway to drive that forward. Um, there's a couple of the documents that, that I referenced in the presentation, the, the Her City and the New Urban Agenda, that push it forwards more. Um, the Her City one has the has the toolbox, which has the um, yeah usable measures to to try and integrate those principles better into planning. Um, but I think it's an area that we can really drive forward. I think it's becoming a lot more prevalent um, across planning. I think there's room for improvement, and I think it's great that it's being spoken about more. Um, gender mainstreaming is becoming where sort of gendered um ensuring gender equality across all areas so it's not just planning it's things like policy work uh pay pensions everything um where gender has to be a central thought throughout it so with that coming forward it, and it is coming forward in planning uh we can hopefully have that more of a focus but i think there's a lot more room for improvement throughout planning policy for sure yeah, I'd like to see that. I'm a bit sceptical whether it is actually happening. For example, you know, with the bollards that were put on our high street, um, they were taken down as soon as one person shouted loudly enough. And it seems like the planning department isn't robust enough to mm. to plan for everyone. And that they, I think in Birmingham anyway, they have, where I'm at, they have a kind of default yes to developments and... Um, it, it does mean that the community uh, doesn't necessarily get um, taken into account. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it I think as you said, serious. it's the voices that shout loud enough, isn't it? Which I think sometimes, it, well, it is it is a shame and not often reflective of, of what is positive progression. Um, I think we've, um, cities can often be designed around the car and I think um, Angie, you might have mentioned in, in last week's cafe that the human scale has been lost sometimes to the car and often it's the default to just make sure, you know, you can park right outside your shop or your house or you can drive right down this road, whereas before it wouldn't have been designed that way. Um, so it's all about how, how do we move forward? Because that can't be the way that we go on forever. It's not sustainable. It's not human scale. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily at the forefront of, of planning. And I think sometimes because it's been this way for so long, if someone shouts loud enough, it's retained and, and it is the car does get a uh, priority over, over the pedestrians or cyclists. Um, so it can be lost in that way, which I think needs addressing. Has anyone encountered this uh, 20 minute neighborhood uh, idea? Uh, have have um, others heard about that or not? Um, or is there something similar where you're based? Um, I think in Italy they're talking about something similar. I don't know if it's the 20 minutes or, but they, this idea that you can just reach everything around you like in the garden elderly houses and but I don't know from my experience like if I because I've, I've used to take the train a lot to go to university and most of the train stations in Italy are not really 
women friendly like you need to go down the stairs and then through halls and then trains are usually late so you get home very late and it's very dark and I've never really felt really safe and I lived for example in Australia and it's very different like everything is I've never felt at risk yeah. I was in Brisbane which is not like one of the biggest cities in Australia but I never felt in danger even at night and in Italy some areas I would still feel like not very comfortable to walk or to be alone because they're not yeah it's as I agree with what Fiona was saying it seems like there's one person saying I want to park my car here I don't want to walk five meters and then they don't care about the project anymore so it's really difficult to see how like what 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 matters for when they're like planning for urban development, what what really matters for them, and what what the priorities are. Yeah, great point. There are um, so the twenty minute neighbourhood is often um, they have the fifteen minute city in Paris, which is really similar um, examples, but within a fifteen minute radius. I think in in Barcelona they have this concept of super blocks. So they've created, I can't remember how big they are now, but um, the sort of the way the space is divided up in, in Barcelona is a lot more linear and sort of square. So they create, I can't remember now how many it is, but I think perhaps like eight or, or 10 blocks and they sort of section it up and make sure that within that space, they have roads that are closed to cars, they have um, ground floor usage, they make sure they have certain shops and facilities and pharmacies available within that space um i don't know if they have anything in italy actually um but the 20 minute neighborhood did i don't think it originated in in australia but in melbourne they've put it at the forefront of, of their uh plan for the area for the next i think 20 years um to make sure that each neighborhood in in melbourne is a 20 minute neighborhood um and it does precisely look at things like uh equal access to transport and train stations and how we design train stations to make them accessible and, and safe and promote active travel people to not hop in their car and use it and i think it's it's sort of chicken and egg perhaps that you need people to have that behavior change in the first place to support that development but then people will come back it and say i'm not going to develop in that way because people are reliant on their car so it's what what do you do first and it's it's going to take that what appears to be radical change to, to really drive it forward i'm i'm just going to jump in again if it's okay because i again i i feel like it's a potentially a problem with uh uk planning but maybe everywhere else experiences this as well in our neighbourhood, we have, um, I think, two supermarkets, um, two more in the planning process, and it's a, it's a tiny high street. So how how can we possibly get like mixed use, or where is that kind of overview planning um, when the default is to say yes to a developer who buys a big patch of land? So we have potentially four supermarkets we have two new housing estates been built but there's no planning for example i know this is veering off safety sorry but uh, there's no planning for extra gps dentists schools massive shortage of school places so um this feels like it's all in the mix of that planning kind of has a role to play but it also doesn't seem to be able to to manage that overview of uh, zoning again at, or uh, being able to encourage mixed use um it it seems um seems a bit sort of pointless <laughs> uh because at the, you know we can only comment but we can't have a, a say in that i'm not even sure whether having more diverse voices or people in the planning mix would help on that front what what's your what do you think i think it's it's where this call for sort of a more radical overhaul of planning is is stemmed from um and i think that it can be a challenge where there are pockets of smaller developments so perhaps 
an estate of, of 10 or 15 homes, it won't reach that trigger to say this amount of housing needs another school or, or needs another pharmacy, but it's the combination of four or five of those developments that really place that strain and, and that's where it becomes apparent that you don't have enough facilities but yet none of them have hit that trigger to say you need to have something so I think it can come back to more of a master planning of an area and I think that is coming through in, in planning policy and in how they're driving through local plans to say that we should you know set out how an area looks at a broader scale and, and as development comes through while it won't hit that individual trigger it might hit a wider trigger um which will call for things and i think that currently isn't present um but it could be and potentially should be but it's what is considered radical perhaps at the moment um but should it be something that we're really pursuing and it's sort of changing the ways that we've done things for so long so it's almost that reluctance to change um but is it is it what's needed uh, we, we certainly had something which, which happened really, which, which was very extraordinary in London, was that we had the Olympic Games, and um, with the Olympic Games came this huge thrust, first of all, to make our public transport as accessible as possible uh, in London, and uh, and so what we we have a the system which is um, quite uh, unusual to be city wide, but we have a city wide basis that um, all public transport should be as accessible as possible and every bus um, you know is uh, fully accessible for someone with a buggy or a wheelchair and um, uh, it's quite funny because people now take that as a norm while only uh, you know less than 10 years ago that wasn't the case at all and uh, and that was the sort of rapid change but it took the Olympic Games <laughs> to make that happen. Um, it really is sort of like, gosh, that's a sort of daunting project, prospect. They have to wait four years and you know go in for a prize draw and win, win the Olympic Games, and that's the only thing that forces your government's hand to uh, to make a, a a change, which is only fairly modest, but is has a huge impact across the city. And it is quite interesting because I have friends who live out of London, uh, who are wheelchair users or. or you know, um, young mums that have buggies and things like that. And they come to London and they say, how, what a joy it is being able to use the public transport, because where they live, they can't. So, you know, it's it's not even UK wide, it's not England wide, it's not uh, um, South East wide, it's not even, but it, the good news is it is, it is London wide. So we, every single bus is fully accessible. Um, and uh, part of the problem we have now with the pandemic, of course, was that we were being discouraged from using public transport. So you have this sort of kind of crazy thing whereby all, all the public transport now uh, realistically has gone bust in London. So um, Transport for London, who run the tubes and the buses and some of the railways, uh, are, are now is now completely um, uh, indebted. And the only way it's been uh, able to run is because it's been taken over by central government. I mean, it's, kind of a weird sort of uh, situation that the pandemic has helped us um, um, by encouraging people to walk more in their local neighborhoods, but has sort of crushed us because of these issues which are sort of much bigger on the sort of planning or public transport. But what I'm also kind of interested in is those small interventions. So are the, are the sort of small things that you've seen or have happened within where you live that uh, make you feel more comfortable about where you uh, when you travel around. I mean, one one of the one of the examples that we we were always sort of interested in was um, uh, the uh, access to the school playground, or um, how many how many school playgrounds, for example, are open to the public. Um, it's kind of funny, you know, you go to um, places like, uh, if you go to Vancouver, every school playground is open to the public as a public playground. Um, um, and yet in the UK and um, most of our school playgrounds are closed off and only used for those for school children. Um, but the problem is not that the problem is not only that the playground isn't open, 
the problem is how you get to the playground and that there is sort of a um, limited number of routes that you can reach on foot uh, pushing a, a buggy um, with ease. And it's how can you make those sorts of changes in a neighborhood um, that really encourage more women to walk? Any views on that? Any sort of uh, low low cost or low uh, small things or any unintended consequences that have actually uh, aided and abetted people rather than uh, made it harder to, to get around. It's not totally into that direction, but maybe a little bit um, the, the human factor, because we've been talking a lot about how a city is built and if there's light and stuff. But I kept wondering for myself, when do I feel safe or unsafe in a city? And I think to me, the most important factors are people and the atmosphere in the place and not how the place is actually built. So I don't really mind if I have to walk into a tunnel, but if the atmosphere in the place is kind of strange or I know that stuff happened there, then I get this feeling. So, uh, and also with, um, when you were talking about Vienna, um, about 10 years ago, I went to Vienna and I talked to a lady who was involved in this restructuring of the parks. And if I recall correctly, one of her observation was also that um, breaking up the, like the soccer fields into smaller areas, also for soccer, made the girls join soccer games and caused more of a mixture. But if, if like the, if the general group is only male and then there's a certain <clears throat> way of acting and exclusion somehow, then it's hard to breach and it causes this distance. And I think those human factors are maybe often overlooked and very important. Definitely. I think it, it stretches, it's beyond just planning. I think that's a great point and, and really interesting actually. And planning is by no means the, the be all and end all and perhaps can encourage the behavior changes, but it is social. Ultimately, it's how people use a space, what they use it for, how we can integrate. And yeah, I think that needs, yeah, appreciation and, and focus in itself. And also, and also what came to my mind in here, close to where I live, we have those from the 60s, those block housings that were really popular during GDR times. And it was very modern and people really liked to live there because it was, well, um, good heating, no coal heating anymore. They had those communal areas. Everything was in straight lines. They at meeting places, shopping areas, swimming pools, and everything in the neighborhood. Um, but then after the fall of the wall, those living areas were not so popular anymore. And a lot of those criteria for safe city or accessible city, city are met there. But if I go there today, because nowadays it's just, I don't know, there's a lot of neo-Nazis living there. So <laughs> I mean, this completely ruins the whole idea of those buildings <laughs> kind of, and it's not social anymore. It became the most anti-social place ever. So yeah, that also came to my mind, those living areas. So Karina, is that something similar to what Alison was saying that, um... The, the 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 blocks in the in the in the community with, that you talk about, the the changes have been that are partly over time the way that people have used them, but also uh, that new developments uh, don't you know are, are not including that kind of those kind of facilities or spaces. Is that what you're saying? Um, I think 
it's more about popularity in this case because during the GDR those were newly built and were those it was part of the communism communal housing and I mean on the negative side today nobody <laughs> likes to live there anymore because the ceilings are very low and you hear everything your neighbors do but back then apparently people didn't mind so there's a lot also in what back then was considered modern and the new thing and the communal and now we prefer like the old buildings and people started to fix the old buildings made them more comfy with um like water heating and stuff which wasn't happening in the 60s so i think it's just a shift of also what is considered modern and nice and popular um yeah i'm not sure if it's really related to the structure as such mm -hmm. Has anyone got any experiences that they've, uh, like, um, how different things were when they were children and now when they're grown up and they're sharing those experiences with their own children or with uh, a younger generation? Do, do you uh, have anything where you think back and you think, gosh, things were better then or actually things were better then, they're better now? You know, are there any sort of things that you've seen in your, in your own lifetimes or your own experience where things have, uh, change for the better or for the worse. I can tell you what we lost in my little area, you know, a five minute walk. We've lost the printers, a laundry, a dry cleaners, an ice cream parlour, which was just a hatch where kids could go to buy ice cream. And um, we've lost uh, a clinic where my son was weighed, he had all his initial checks, we had the childbirth classes, um, all the developmental checks, I had my eye tested there, that's all gone. Um, hairdressers, gone. Um, a spa shop, gone. And new shops that were put into the new developments were after a year, nobody would take them up, and obviously because the rents were too high, so they were converted into more flats, so that facility had gone. And we're about to lose the hall where I voted for the last 30 years. Um, so that was local and general elections. We lost all those stories as well so all those connections the chap who fixed computers very cheaply the wool shop um nobody knits really any uh, anymore these days but um it, they sold haberdashery as well and with that the grocers uh, so you know where i'm going with this i don't have to drag out the point but we had so many things to keep our neighborhood ticking and everything is gone now. So what, what one needs to try to do is recreate uh, incidental or serendipitous um, uh, inconsequential uh, meeting of people in public space. That's basically it, isn't it? I mean, you know, you don't need to be great mates with your neighbours, but what's good is if you if they acknowledge you and you acknowledge them, so there's a sort of passing knowledge of these people that that that's the thing that make, makes the place feel safer is that what you're saying Alison it's that that kind of thing oh I've, I've probably not heard sorry yeah um well has anyone anyone else got any thoughts or experience they want to chip in The blokes are being very quiet too, aren't they? Well, I can throw in a question uh, if you like. Um, although I'm not totally sure how to uh, formulate the question, but um, what we're talking about and what Sarah has presented is um, 
to me, it's like, and I think everyone agrees here, is like kicking in an open door. It's very obvious. Uh, cities are not uh, pleasant and they are not safe for like half the population, whether it's uh, Leeds, London or uh, New York. Um, um, so these things need to change, but they're not really changing or they're only changing in, um, well, maybe parts of Vienna, uh, apparently. Um, so, but uh, no, women are half uh, the voting um, uh, population, um, and I'm sure many men also uh, agree with uh, the underlying premise. Now, how come uh, change is not happening? Why is this not a political issue? Why uh, do I not see uh, in the UK either the Tories or uh, Labour or uh, what is it, the Greens or uh, the Lib Dems uh, making uh, something like this a spare point in their um, program? Uh, and why do I not see this anywhere else in any uh, political program in Europe or elsewhere? How come if this is such an issue, apparently it's not an issue? Why is this? I don't have the answer, but I would like to know. <laughs> I don't have the answer either. I think I'd have a lot more money if I had the answer. <laughs> um, but no, it should, it should. And it's it's being talked about more and it's being talked about at, at different levels and it, it's not um, just planning, but it's, it's how can we get it higher up the agenda? Um, and perhaps it's what we were talking about before that it feels radically different and, and change, change and difference is, is scary and, and often uh, not accepted and people try and resist it so how can we make how can we prompt that change um, and I think it's coming forward in pockets but I would like to see see it more and, and higher and yeah I, I don't have the answer either why, why it's not more shouted about yeah, I'm also, of course, not asking you for the answer, right? Anyone else can chime in, but um, uh, maybe we can discuss this indeed. But, but I hear your point about that people are conservative. Humans are conservative. They do not like change, right? They like to stick to the things that they know, whatever it is. Um, people are hard to convince of um, uh, uh, of doing uh, do it, what they're doing differently from how they've been doing it. Um, but you've also noticed in this talk, right or in this presentation and the people that have been talking here um what is often part of the narrative is that we have lost something in comparison to what we had so actually what <laughs> these people like ourselves that are looking to um, make these changes actually want to change it to something that was there before so it's not like we're looking for a change to something that didn't exist we are at least in part looking for change to something that was there before and has changed in the first place. So that that resistance to change only applies to a limited extent because it's actually a desire to go back in parts to something that was there before, the more human scale of the neighborhood. Uh, now, if, if we present it like this, it should be much easier. Who doesn't agree with a more human scale of the neighborhood? Who wants to have less person or less more impersonal uh, an approach to uh, to their neighborhood? No one, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Fiona, chip in, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think there is um, more of a discourse following the Sarah Everard case in the UK, um, but uh, often it is around uh, what women, you know, fixing things for women. Um, I'm not sure which MP it was, but uh, it's been suggested that uh, women can have access to an app. So it's not 999, it's like an emergency service. Oh, it's a yeah. so say eight that we can log in, we can say where we're walking, we're expected to be home, and we will be tracked a bit like, you know, the, the apps that you can get on phones at the moment. Uh, so we'll be tracked so that if we're not where we're meant to be, and it's just horrifically dystopian. It's like, yeah. yes, it's sort of, it makes sense to a certain person, but you know, this is putting the uh, everything on women to um, yeah. uh, to avoid the the problem, which is um, a violence of some kind or attack or yeah. harassment. Yeah. Um, to, to me, I think the I don't know if it's necessarily going back because I don't think you can uninvent things like the car 
But um, if I look back to my childhood, uh, we had to go everywhere by walking or public transport. And so did many other people who were working class. So there was a volume of people, like Karina said, you know, if there are people there, then you feel safer to walk. If if there's no one there, like the, the Leeds High Street picture that Sarah said, you know, I can see how that exemplifies, you know, good behaviour, but um, just having more lighting and wider streets and uh, it doesn't make a difference when the shops all close at six o'clock, for example. Um, you know, there, there needs to be more people um, and how how you roll back the car and car usage. Um, people are very, very resistant to that. But I don't think tracking with is the answer and I don't think surveillance cameras and CCTV is the answer either. No, 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 absolutely not. Uh, it, it's it's like uh, very reactive in exactly the same way that uh, um, there is now talk that you, the, the United Kingdom or, or Great Britain's government is going to facilitate this app that is supposed to uh, track women. Um, it, it's extremely reactive and it doesn't solve the root cause of the problem. Um, but having said this, there there is in places, there is change. Vienna is one example, but of course, uh, the poster child of change in this respect is uh, the Netherlands, so, uh, where lots of inner cities uh, and neighborhoods have been converted over the last 40 years into car-free or car-restricted uh, neighborhoods, right? Um, and and uh, and again, there when these changes happen, no one is complaining. Everyone loves it. So it's like <laughs> if the the majority love the people who live there, they love it. And really, they yeah, well, what, what, well, I grew up in the Netherlands, right? So there's that. Um, and of course, there is always people that complain, but the quality of life in the cities that see this change uh, improves significantly for everyone, visitors and people who live there. But of course, some people complain because they take away the boards. Was that not someone who mentioned this earlier? Yeah, Sarah said this, right? Um, but that that doesn't <laughs> address or yeah, that doesn't that's not an answer to my question, right? Uh, if it makes so much sense, why is this not so much more of a political issue? Because if it would be, it would be it would be so easy to vote this into change. Everyone would agree. But apparently, there's other things that are more important. But are they, or are we being, yeah, in a way, lied to that they are more important? Economic progress, whatever that means, for example, right? Uh, um, I have two things to say. <laughs> First, I did not mean to say that. Empty streets are scary all the time, um, at least not for me. I don't mind empty streets at all. It's more about the general atmosphere of a place or if there is a group of people that appear scary for some reason. Um, and then for the political um, side of things, you what you were talking about, Babak, um, at least in Leipzig, it's not on the on the large scale agenda of any political party, but we have local politics who are or politicians who are involved in local, um, often grassroots movements, working in the neighborhoods, trying to change things. Uh, creating community gardens, parks, playgrounds, whatever. So I think it's not on the on the large scale the, those movements to, but more from like from the bottom up maybe. And to me, this is the best way to do it. I think people should be involved in their neighborhood, and from their experience go upwards and change the city and not planners looking onto the city and changing the whole big picture. I, I, to me, it seems logical that it should be the other way around. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, uh, city planning, at least in the sense as to how uh, cities are experienced by individuals, is something that needs to be done from the ground up. It's the only way possible because you and I are experiencing our neighborhood, so it only makes sense if we have a say in how our neighborhoods are designed and how um, they function for us. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, cities are not designed by inhabitants, they are designed by city planners. Um, and that does go through uh, certain cycles 
um, it, indeed, if you think back to, uh, say, uh, up till the 90s, um, so let's say up, uh, until, the, until the end of the 70s, um, it was much more in the whole of Europe um, the focus on in, in respect to urban design to create individual communities within cities that would be self-sustaining, like what Sarah's example um, um, showed, the super blocks in Barcelona uh, within a certain space, everything needs to be accessible, like the 15-minute city. Now we have a name for it. We did it, of course, 40 years ago, um, so that you can get everything within walking distance. But um, what we, of course, saw from the 70s and 80s onwards is the creation of these satellite towns uh, where you were designed to um, uh, commute from to the big city to do to do to go to work and to do your big shopping, um, which is something city planners do. That is not something that comes from the ground up. They design these urban um, uh, accesses um, uh, where people only could live and not well, where people only could sleep and not live. Uh, so it's it's not just from the ground up. It's also uh, from the top down. But of course, it's it's a combination of these two. But where the latter, uh, sorry, where the former that is from the ground up is something that you and I do. The other that's political. That's that's deciding which architect gets to implement or which city planner gets to implement uh, which city plan. That's typically not something that the average citizen can decide on. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of both at least. Right? Right. Yeah. yeah, I think back, 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 I think you're right. I mean, it's, uh, it is both. You have to have the top down and the bottom up. Uh, the thing that, because I I've worked in this area for a long time, so I kind of feel, um, you, you know, um, perhaps I, I I feel like I'm sort of saying the same same thing over and over again, and uh, you, you know. Um, I uh, bore the pants off my wife. She's uh, really uh, wearied by these things I say. But some of the, some of the things which are quite extraordinary is that people don't realize what they can aspire to um, and that uh, they can be living in a neighborhood and feel that nothing can change. And yet you can take them to another neighborhood, which is actually within walking distance of where they live, but might be a little bit further than that. And then they see things and they can see the changes and they go, wow, can we have some of this in our neighborhood? And the answer is, yeah, you can. But because rather from what Babak has said, you haven't voiced for it in some way or other, it doesn't necessarily happen. And this, this is the thing that I think the pandemic has changed dramatically, is that because people are or have been walking so much around their local neighborhoods, They've now realized what value their local neighborhoods could offer them. They've, they, they've recognized what they, their local neighborhoods have, which previously many people didn't know. You, the number of times I've taken people on a walk and they've gone, oh, I never knew this garden existed. Oh, where's this park come from? And oh, I never knew you could buy things here. I didn't see this small line of shops. You know, so. It was quite a lot of times we'd take people and it'd be eye openers. Now I take people around their local neighborhood and they say, no, 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 we've walked around here dozens of times. We had nowhere else to go. That's all we were able to do in the last 18 months was walk our local neighborhood. So one of the things that I think the pandemic could provide is this push to get more changes for people to aspire for better things in their neighborhood. But um, uh, maybe it's not an issue enough or not enough of an issue as yet. But maybe it'll change. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to add one little footnote to this, uh, if I may. Um, it's a little bit like uh, um, climate change. No one, well, virtually no one believes that climate change does not exist. Everyone thinks that we need to fight climate change. Yet we are not, or at least not not nearly enough. Uh, it, how does this make How does this make sense? <laughs> We should all be, you know, recycling and not flying and not driving, and um, to to prevent a scenario where literally two generations from now we are all dead. Um, but we don't do it. But does anyone think we should not? Well, almost no one. Yet we don't do it. I think it's it's the same underlying cause. Whatever the cause is, I think it's the same thing. Now I'll stop. <laughs> I was say right. about the um, use of the, the the change in the way that the planning gain is uh, apportioned because we used to have 
Station 106 money and meant that if you had to develop in your area, then the money had to be spent for the benefit of that neighbourhood. And now we've got the community infrastructure levy, which uh, is spent on larger projects. And that is a very big political decision and there's big political battles. And it's the politicians that spend that money and not the neighbourhood. And I'll give you an example. Um, Babak made me think of this because we started to have home zones in Kingston um, under the Section 106 agreement. There was a lot of fighting over that. People thought it was very unfair that all of a sudden these people got home zones. So they were very popular. Um, and then we then we went over to the SIL system, community infrastructure levy, and that money could be put to uh, use as quiet streets, parklets, um, all the things that they they're doing in Waltham Forest at the moment, which is absolutely fantastic. Even bus stops are being turned into little parks, but we're not doing that. We've chosen not to do that, as I say, the politicians that are using that money and it's not for the benefit of the local community. The local community have not got a say in that anymore. That's been one retrograde step, uh, step in the change from the Section 106 money, uh, the planning gain, to the community infrastructure levy. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that might be very England specific, Alison, but I, wish it, I don't know about elsewhere. But that certainly, you're absolutely right. That is a change in, uh, uh, in, in, in the fact that a developer has to pay money towards the uh, um, the community and how how that money can be spent. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for for hosting me. It's been great, and thank you everyone for listening and in being so responsive and asking and answering questions. So. I really enjoyed myself and thank you so much everyone for, for coming along.